Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. My name is Rafael Yosseini. And uh, youth development in Nigeria is a continuous process. It's a process that involves different methods. Uh, to some, the use of sports, especially football, has made a lot of difference in the life of so many Nigerian youth who now plays football professionally, both home and abroad. In Nigeria, football is usually considered as the most favored sport and activity because of its connectivity and the purpose of unity it brings. That's why football academies who leverage on this uh, trait of football are waxing stronger and expanding their inspiring abilities. In the suburb of Abelkuta, the Ogun State capital, southwest Nigeria, there's a little town called Wasimi, located at kilometer 26 at Songota Expressway. Here in Wasimi, the Nigerian football captain, Egonem, will be considered one of the greatest footballers have emerged and have birthed something really transformational. He inspires young people with his story and his giftings, and he's constantly been a panacea in the Nigerian media space for so many years. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we bring to you the mathematical himself, uh, Shegu uh, Odegbami. We've got a lot we will be talking to. He now joins us. Uh, you know, to discuss football, youth development. We also analyzed recent FIFA fine and life ban and, you know, Super Eagles coach uh, Samson Siasia. It's a joy having you here once again. Thank you. Good to see you. Great to have you. Uh, you know, when, when we talk Shegu Odegwami, Shegu Odegwami means many things to many people. But one thing a lot of people don't know about Shegu Odegwami is the political side to Shegu Odegwami. <laughs> well, tell us, tell us that experience. <laughs> you ran for governor of Ogun State. Yeah, that was um, the best education that I've had in my life. And uh, I tell people that I went to Rapid Results College. Mm. I had to learn politics within a very short time. And I took the most difficult course uh, from nowhere, attempting to become governor of one of the most sophisticated states in Nigeria. So that was um, a big dream. And um, I... I'm glad that I went through the entire course from start to finish. If I had gone to any of the major political parties, it wouldn't have happened. Uh, my plane wouldn't have left the tarmac. Mm. But going through a small party that just started gave me the opportunity to go through the whole hog. And at the end of it, I am a much better person. I understand the country a lot better. I know people very, very well now. And uh, my objective for going into politics, which is to make my contribution as much as I possibly can to changing our world, mm. um, is still on course. So I can't leave the political terrain. I will still remain there. Mm. Haven't tasted of it, haven't seen it and experienced it. And um, I believe I now know the course to chart within that terrain. What are the lessons you've learned? Or what lessons did you learn in that couple of months leading up to that election? <laughs> what were the lessons? Well, quite a lot. The first thing is that the world is not designed so that we, particularly the black people, should succeed or even thrive. The How? world as a whole, the architecture of the world, the way it is, is not designed so that we should succeed. We are just players. And uh, we are pawns and victims. And the more you go into political history, the more you find out that that's what it is. But we won't go into those details now. But mm. I had to go that way to be able to connect what is happening mm. in Wasim, in my local community, with what is happening in America. Because one affects the other, and one mm. could influence the other. So that was my first lesson, to know that... Um, you know, I'm a disadvantaged person in the world. Mm. And for me to succeed as a black person um, would take working 10 times as hard as the others. So um, Chief Obafemi Awolo has said so many things that because I didn't study history, that I missed out. But going into politics, I start to see where he was going politically, particularly in Western Nigeria where he took us, particularly the Yorubas, uh, took our strengths, our language, our culture, our intelligence, 
and gave us Western education to add to that, and made us one of the foremost um, black people on earth at the time. Started putting in place structures for us to become uh, what Nancy Mandela said, that until Nigeria appreciates that it is the, the leader of the black race, the black man is going nowhere. So mm -hmm. it would all start from here. We are the most populous, so, 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 we are the best read even in America mm -hmm. as Nigerians. Our culture is the richest in the world. We have so much that what we have been told that all those things are not right. So we have diminished them and we have embraced that which will never take us there. So we need to go back to who we are as Nigerians, as Yoruba people, look back again at our culture, the richness of it, our traditions, our history, you know, and now we have science, technology, we have our intellect mm. from the Western world. Combine these two and you have probably the, the best civilization ever mm. in the world. So that is the kind of vision that I now have of where the black man should be, whereas the black man is right there at the bottom. So it goes beyond Ogun State. So you said you learned that lesson that everything is, is not you know, wired to favor the black man. What were other lessons? You said you learned a lot about human beings. <laughs> I just told you one. This is one yeah. of it. This, this is one, one of it. it. One. You, you know, why do we have so much crisis, so much... You know, everybody is fighting. We are killing each other. We are not. We are not together. Even within Yoruba land or Igbo land, you still find the different uh, uh, dialects. You know, clans. There's so much fight. It has to go on. It won't stop, and it is not our creation. It is the construction of the world that in Nigeria, that should lead the black race, is now one of the poorest. We are counted amongst one of the poorest in the world, if you really look at what's happening you know, at the grassroots. Whereas we should be one of the most gifted, advanced, you know, sophisticated. We have everything. Mm -hmm. you know? so, but that's, how we re that's where we really are, you know, at that level. So things are not working because they are not designed to work. And there's an indoctrination that says you cannot do it. So we are fighting and quarreling. But it is so simple. It is so simple that if only we can look at the divisions and come together and make them a strength, we will be the greatest civilization in the world, black, of black people in the world. That's, what we are going, that's where we should be heading. This country, that's where we should be heading. It's a shame that we wake up every day, our leaders wake up every day, and they can't see the potentials in us, the potentials of this country to be foremost in the world. It may not be in our generation, but we should lay that foundation and chart that course and come together and not reduce it to small power struggles, but see the strength in each one of us and come together and build it up. And don't, don't, let our, don't diminish our own culture and history and civilization and all of that that you see all around, see our young people, see what they are doing in music, see what we are doing in film, see what we are doing in sport, see what we are doing in science and technology, but we are not doing them here. They have taken the best of us to go and do it out there and created an environment here where they cannot thrive. We should start to rewire our thinking. And the more we do that, the greater it's going to be for us. So those are lessons. Mm -hmm. That you learned. That I learned just going into politics mm. and seeing the reality on ground. If I, I can choose to think of what I experienced and say, Nigeria is irredeemable. You can't solve it. There's no how you can solve the problems. I can also choose to see that situation and say, ah, this is an opportunity for young people to come up and now become heroes. Because it won't take much for them to become heroes. Nothing is working. So just do something to make certain things work, and you become a hero. So there's so much to do in this country. And we must not channel all our energies and vision to doing those things positively, rather than fighting and killing each other, you know. And, and when you look at your life, your life has been a kind of realistic example of this. Starting off as a footballer, now getting into the media, 
now being a politician. <laughs> well, being they are a, all connected. Be, being, being a businessman. But one thing I'd like to talk to you about real quickly is Wasimi. At what point in your life did you decide to say, let's go back to Wasimi? And what does Wasimi mean for Nigeria as a country and the globe in general? Well, I listened to Bill Clinton. I met him in 2004 when I went to the University of Rhode Island for a youth uh, pro project. It's the World College Games or something like that. And he was there and he spoke about the globalization of the world and what we can all do. We cannot change the world, but we can all make a, a difference. We can make our contributions to changing the world. So through the conversations we had, um, the United Nations set up a small unit to use sports, sports in particular, to eradicate illiteracy, hunger, disease, HIV, joblessness, and all of those things. Sports to eradicate those things. And they actually made those part of the Millennium Development Goal project. So it was an eye-opener that sports could actually do all of those things beyond just winning medals and trophies and all of those things. But it takes understanding it, which I see is the problem here, because we just see sports as going to play a match and winning, go to the Africa Games and win medals, whereas sports could actually help to change the world. So it was that aspect of sport that I took up and said, OK, let me see how we can plant this seed in Nigeria. Let people start to see it differently. Let me set up models that people can see. Because if you just speak about it, it wouldn't make sense. But if you do it, they would see it, and probably they would now emulate and do it. So what, what is going on in Wasimi is that. Wasimi was virgin territory. That's the village I came from. Mm. I just took one look at it from the road, and what I saw was paradise. And I said, OK, let me go and establish something there that would be more than just sport going to play for the fun of it. Mm. Sport is health. Sport is education. Sports is unifying the people. Sport is big business, one of the fastest growing businesses in the world that can absorb 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 most of our young people. Because sport is not just running and jumping. It's about the law of it, it's about the medicine of it, it's about the manufacturing of it, it's about the agency of it, organizing it, it's the architecture of it. You want to do stadia, you want to do this, you want to organize it mm. and bring people together and effect or support the economy of a community. Mm. In what I mean now, there are almost 3,000 young people and officials from different parts of the country mm. that have assembled on their own. And for two weeks, they are participating in a football championship. Mm. Mm. Children from 13 to about 18. Mm. And life in that place has changed completely. Mm. So you need to go and see. It's a model that mm. other people should just see and mm. emulate if they so choose. Mm. OK, so uh, but, but before we go on a quick break, we, we've got a breaking news that EFCC uh, raids Ambody's residence. Uh, uh, that's the former governor of Lagos, uh, uh, Kiyomi Ambody. We have a breaking news on the ticker here that EFCC uh, raids Ambody's residence. And, and, and I'm sure that in subsequent bulletins, we'll get more information about that. We'll come back after this quick commercial break. Right, welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. And uh, we brought you the information before we went on that break that the FCC uh, raised the home of the former governor of uh, Lagos, uh, Akiomi Ambody. And this has been going on for quite some time. Uh, we've had uh, back and forth in the newspaper and allegations and counter allegations. About certain billions of naira seen in the account of the former governor of uh, Lagos State. I mean, let's not forget that he too was a firm contender in the public space to become a minister. Uh, and when the, the ministerial nomination list was made, finally, was, uh, social media was awash with stories of Ambadi not making it. That might just be his uh, award to not making a ministerial position. But uh, it's been on for quite some time, and uh, the jury's out on this. Finally, 
Uh, some people will say, okay, EFCC has gone in there. What is going to be the allegations leveled against him? How are we going to look at this in the coming days? And definitely, what I can tell you for free is that this story will herald the news space in the coming days, because in the coming days, we'll have more uh, revelations as regards this. Uh, only recently, Akil Meambody was out on a holiday in the United States of America. Uh, we, we don't know maybe if he's back in the country, but if he's back in the country, I'm sure definitely his media aid will have some reactions to this. So this is going to herald the Nigerian news space in the coming days. All we're just going to tell you here at Arise TV is watch this space because definitely uh, this is going to be another story that analysts and pundits will look at and look at critically. And also we're going to get reactions from the EFCC in the coming days. So we can assure you uh, very veritably that we'll have uh, hands-on guests that will come talk about these issues talk about issues of corruption and other cases uh, in Nigeria and various allegations leveled against a former top government functionary. And this comes on the heels of another case currently going on uh, as regards uh, the P&ID incident uh, that slimed Nigeria with an 8.9 billion naira fine. So we'll look at that and other issues on the coming days, definitely on the morning show here on Rise uh, News. But moving over back to you now, I saw you chuckled a bit uh, <laughs> while you saw that story. You're a politician too. This, this could have been you. No, this is not politics. <laughs> is this politics? Okay. This is co corruption incorporated. Yeah. And it just reminds us about who we are, where we are coming from, where, you know, the things that we do in this country. Nobody, you know, is immune mm. from the effect of this corruption that is everywhere. Mm. So the, the bigger news would have been if you have somebody who has served government mm. and leaves it and there's nothing found in his account. Mm. That would be the bigger news. Well, we used to have stories like that in the <laughs> 60s. You know, it was said uh -huh. about Tafawa Balewa that only 20,000 naira was found Absolutely. in his account and he was Absolutely. prime minister of this country. All right, let's, let's go back. So you met President Clinton in 2004 mm. and, you know, the United Nations... Uh, uh, project. project and yeah. and you you started Wasimi. Yeah. So you started Wasimi. You went back to your home. So Wasimi, you have different competitions going on. Uh, are, are you funneling these players to Europe? What is the market viability <laughs> of it? You know, because a lot of people are no, saying no, no, no. that's uh, that, that's not our direction in Wasimi. But but you've had a couple of players from Wasimi. Wasimi that are... No, Wasimi is a school. Mm. Is a secondary school. Okay. Basically, is a normal secondary school. People go there, children from age 10, and they live at about 16, go through the process of the classes from G G GS1 to SS3, do their WAEC, mm. but we also do the scholastic aptitude test. Okay. So what we do is make sure that all the children that come there get well-educated. The quality of our education is first class. Mm. At the same time, we give them what is their passion. Because if you don't have passion for sports, you cannot come there. It's not just football. It is you have a passion for sports. Most of those children are children that don't want to go to school anymore. Mm -hmm. They want to be like JJ Okocha, Kanu, and they give their parents a lot of trouble and all of that. And then they bring those children to us. So we do the transformation from children who don't love education to children who, through sports now, get to now... Understand that education is simple. Mm. Once you can deliver it to them in an easy, pictorial way that is interesting. Mm. And then you make it conditional that if you don't study, you cannot play. Mm. So they are in this environment. It's a fully residential school. It's, you know, everybody's in the boarding house. Mm. And it's far away from the hustle and bustle mm. of city life. Mm. So you are just there in this community. And you have four hours of sports every day. Every mm. day, four hours. We are looking for six hours. Mm. By the time we get to six hours, we are going there, I'm sure, from September, when Lee Evans, the former world and Olympic champion, American, is going to join our team in the school to produce world-class athletes. Mm. So it's a school and it's an academy for sports. So we do tennis, basketball, football, you know, like that. We do... All, we give children all those opportunities to do. And then, mm. when they finish at 16, instead of going to Europe to go and play professional football, we tell them that, you see, all those that go, they lie. They don't go until they are 21, 22. They change their ages, they get more mature, they play, they think they are 16, they take them to Europe. So you don't do that. You spend the next four years 
until you get to about age 20 to get a first degree. So how do you get the first degree? We send them to America. We've created a path for them with American colleges and universities, so many of them, because they are qualified academically, they are good in sports, four hours of sports every day, mm. turns them into sports machines. And so right now we have over 50 of them on full scholarships in, in American, American colleges and universities. Well, what are those colleges you're in partnership with? So many of them. They mm. are coming. Mm. More and more of them are learning about the school, and they are coming. And, of course, the American embassy sees that this is a genuine project. How do, how do you fund the school? <laughs> how do you fund well, it? First two years, first two years, mm. I did all, all the students went through school free of charge. Mm. I had to pay for the teachers, pay for this. I this had a few resources. Rich, no, no, I had a few resources <laughs> then. But after that, it became more challenging. We wrote to governments, to corporate organizations. A few helped us. Indomie helped us. FCMB helped us to do a few things. But it is not enough because they don't understand it. They don't understand the, the philosophy of it. Mm. But more and more they will get to understand. And the more they do, the more we are going to get help. But the school is running. Mm. It's running. It's not a burden on me anymore. Mm. Parents can see it, so they now pay to keep their children there. And they are guaranteed a good life after school. So by the mm. time they graduate, we have so many mm. that have graduated, mm. they can now go professionally in Europe. Exciting stuff. But let's talk mm. a little bit about corruption, graft. I mean, we just had a breaking story about um, Akiomi um, Body, um, EFCC Ratings Department. We've also had cases of corruption in the Super Eagles. <laughs> how players will pay certain people to play. And now we have the FIFA case and Samson Siasia case. I mean, what's your read on all of this? Well... And in your time, did you pay to play in the Super Eagles? No. On the Green Eagles then? In Na the Nigeria was a totally different place then. Okay. It was a different world. Nigeria was a different world. We were on the ascendancy then. Mm. And we didn't know how the things that the people of this generation know. Uh, football cannot be immune from the rest of the polity. You know, we have a country where in all spheres, mm. you find the stories you hear, the whole place is littered with stories of corruption. Mm. It's not just stories now. We are also involved, mm. either as accomplices or we are complicit to mm. the things that are going. So we know. So mm. how can you now say that in football it, there cannot be? Football is, in fact, in the vanguard of corruption. of corruption, even as players, to go and play a match, it is not free and fair. It's not a level playing field. They bribe referees, they bribe players, they bribe officials who fix the referees. We've known this for so long. So it's a part and parcel of us as a country that corruption is in our DNA. Mm. So this FIFA thing, which is of particular interest to me, particularly Samson. Because you know Samson. Yeah, the Samson Siasia story. It is very unfortunate. But this is my own take. How can you punish a man maximally? You kill, in fact, his own punishment is that they have killed Samson Siasia. What did he do? They have not told us exactly what he did. He didn't, there, there was no act. They didn't say that he fixed a match. They said he intended to fix a match. We, don't, we haven't seen the evidence. And you now ban him. We have had worse cases, even from the highest uh, order. In FIFA, in CAF, in all those places, we have seen a Nigerian who was even filmed, recorded and filmed and transmitted worldwide, who was actually demanding and, you know, bribes and all mm. of that. And... No such punishment was needed. But to ban a man for life, to find him after banning him for life, to damage his name and his image for an act that he did not commit, I think it was just like killing an ant with a sledgehammer. I'm not saying he didn't do wrong. I don't know what he did. But even from what they said he did, an intention many years ago, in two, from 2008. But, but the said FIFA is going to be sending uh, a technical report, a document to the NFF on, of what really happened. Because when you go to FIFA's website, nobody's seen anything. But the damage is done. You have killed the man already. 
It was late by Baton Day just said. I said, once one lie has been told about you and publish, publicized, don't even allow one minute to pass through before you start to refute it. Because if you don't, that lie will sustain. I, I mean, how is the thing? You're close to Samson. You might have spoken to... Absolutely. This. I was uh, what, one what, of those what, that promoted him because I knew him as a player. What, what, Very the, smart guy. What's the physical... What's the mental state of mind of, of Samson, CRC, and now going to the fact that his mother is still in the now, kidnappers? They have killed day. Samson. That what they have just done is he was dead before, and then they now went and committed murder on top of that with Samson. I don't know how is he going to cleanse himself now. What will happen? What will ever happen to now restore the image that he had? a great Nigerian player, an ambassador of this country, somebody that served us well, that did so well for us. And all you can say is that he intended to. We haven't seen any evidence. We should have seen the evidence first before you place such a huge ban on him. Even if he intended to, 10 years ago, then you now come. They said it is because he did not respond to his email. I would really love to see something. I'm trying to get him to even tell me why he did not respond to a simple email. Can he go to the FIFA Court of Arbitration? Of course now. Of course, he has to appeal. He has to do all of those things. But the damage is mm. done. Thank you so much, uh, the mathematical Shegon, when we MON. I really appreciate you for your time and your insight here, so thank you so much.